I think we can all agree that a holiday-themed horror is a subgenre that does a great job in diversifying the terror landscape, giving us something unnerving to enjoy while in the festive spirit. The joy of the most positive holiday, intermixed with fear, is a combination that fits like a glove, if that glove was whiskey and coke outside of a beach bar with that fresh ocean breeze. And so today we are talking about a newer flick that jumped high on my list as one of the best Christmas horror entries in a long while. One with grit, gore, and a hell of a lot of charm. And listen, let me be the first to say, you can never go wrong with a killer robot Santa. All right, let's pour some of that spiked eggnog and plug in the lights, because uh, today we dig into the wonderful world of Christmas Bloody Christmas. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. One of the uh, newer titles I've covered, this debuted in December of 2022. Written and directed by Joe Begas, Christmas Bloody Christmas nails the fundamental of not what only makes a great horror flick, but this fully embraces the holiday setting. And I can sum it up in three parts. Dialogue slash chemistry, kills, and tone slash setting. And, uh, well, the humor works surprisingly well, and it doesn't deflate or overrun the tension. Does that make it four? Ah, oh, shit. Oh, I can't do that. Alright, let's maybe, we'll put that as a bonus. But starting off with fake Christmas commercials in this sort of bizarro world is clever. And it sets up the cynical tone to come. And I'd like to give a shout out to Coons's Cream Pies and Slim Janko Irish Whiskey. Wow, Slim Janko! This is just what I wanted! <laughs> you know, the, the two things every man holds near and dear to his heart. This movie touches on two of my favorite types of subgenres, talking movies and an unstoppable killer. So I should say this, spoilers lie ahead. And if two charming characters waxing poetic about movies and music, while a killer robot Santa terrorizes a town, that sounds like your cup of hot chocolate. Hey, see what I did there? Then get on Christmas bloody Christmas. Then meet me back here once you're done. Now for the rest of us, let's go. Starring Riley Dandy as Tori Toombs, Sam Delich as Robbie Reynolds, the entire foundation on which Christmas Bloody Christmas stands on is from how well Riley and Sam play off each other. The emotional bond forged through passionate arguments. Tori owns basically my dream record store, while Robbie is her sassy yet loyal employee. And like every single soul on earth, she wants to get off in more ways than one. It's Christmas Eve, and now that she has blown off her booty call, she spends the evening chatting and drinking with Robbie. Immediately, I'm fully in. Because of how well these two dance together. Googly eyed Tina. Do you want me to keep that going? Was that Do was a condition. That was a condition. She couldn't help it. Okay. Outside of Joe Bigas's energetic blocking, the nuance of attraction and friendship can only work if these two actors fully embrace the characters. And they do, from Christmas music arguments. Uh, glad for the better religion shout out, by the way. Do you not agree that there's no good fucking Christmas music, no good Christmas movies, Bad just fucking get it over with? Great Christmas album. To the importance of eating <laughs> It's a blast just being engrossed in this conversation, the natural back and forth. And I'm gonna head off the critique that there are too many F-bombs. You know, I work downtown in a woman-centric field, and outside of the uh, snappy rhythm, I have heard very similar conversations. Also, cut the f*** up if swearing bothers you, dude, come on. And in my long life on this earth, I have never heard anyone outside of myself shouting into the ether about the merits of Pet Cemetery 2 and the magnificent motherfucking Clancy Brown. No brain, no pain. Clancy fucking Brown. You're goddamn right. I, um, I feel seen. Listen, it's cliche to say characters matter most, but uh, it's not. They do. And Sam Delich and Riley Dandy feel like two old friends who just want to drink, argue, and fuck. I mean, isn't that sort of the spirit of the holiday? But we're not just here for the great discussions, but for the actual horror. And nothing gets held back. It's brutal and unforgiving. And when your first kill is splitting a man in half with an axe while in the midst of doggy style, it's safe to say Christmas Bloody Christmas won't be uh, one of those it's what you don't see that is truly scary type of slashers. No, 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 no. This embraces the Rob Zombie type of violence, and I'm all for it. 
Not too many of these kill the only kid off. And actually, speaking of, Jeff Daniel Phillips shows up as the miserable and uh, done with a life sheriff. You're gonna wake up a sleeping lion, Junior. It's a small role, but I love the guy's screen presence and he always puts in good work. And this is no exception. <laughs> Plus his death got a good chuckle out of me. Oh, fuck. And let's make sure to put some respect on the killer sent himself, Abraham Ben Ruby. Jerry Markovic from ER, Roddy Belt from Bosch. But as someone whose childhood was in the 90s, this is a legend we refer to as Mr. Kubiak. And best put some respect on the name of the great Parker Lewis can't lose. Abraham's super cool as Killer Sant, who looks uh, hilariously evil before it even starts killing. It's a great and fun idea, and, and Abraham has the physical stature that makes his Terminator-esque drive threatening. And obviously, with superhuman strength, we get gnarly and over-the-top kills, which, honestly, I won't be able to show you here, but nothing is tame. Like the F-bomb heavy dialogue, the kills and gore effects along with them pull no punches. Look-wise, Begus and cinematographer Brian Sowell go for the down and dirty 16mm look and drench every ounce with neon and Christmas lights. It's a purposeful stylistic choice that adds a lot, and again, it fits the tone. Not that a clear and more realistic look wouldn't work, but you know we've seen that. It's standard. I I'm all for this retro grime, giving us a more grindhouse approach. And honestly, the, the look of this movie feels way more Christmas because of it. And real quick, I'd like to give some credit to the editing by editor Josh Ethier, as the intensity and buildup really pops and gives this a relentless feel. The car chase scene is a great example of the type of energy an editor gives. And of course, this movie is tightly paced, but there are a lot of creative cuts that layer the tension in a clever way, which is obviously complemented by the score by Steve Moore. Now, I gotta be honest, I have one small complaint, which is you know more of a personal opinion, but it must be said. Every argument in this feels uh, properly balanced. And though the movie seems to sort of side with Riley's character Dandy more than Sam's, I never felt like Sam didn't have a decent argument to beat back, except with this. Soundgarden, Cornell cuts his hair off, opts for the Spencer's gift tips with the frosted spice, and then the motherfucker's really super unknown way Yeah, no, no. Let me, let me fix this real quick and give the real counter argument. Bullshit. All you got is Cornell's goofy style change. Yeah, sure. The hip 90s hair looked dumb. Fair enough. But what the f*** does that have to do with their musical ability? Bad Motor Finger kicks ass. Slaves and Bulldozers is brilliant and you couldn't get a better concert closer. But let's not look over the vocal melody in the chorus of Mind Riot. A clear indication of their growing songwriting ability. Now, if you mean slightly less heavy, Sure, f*** it, why not? But then actually listen to Super Unknown and try not to ignore the heavy and thick chokehold of Mailman or the growing anger in Limo Wreck. And if there's, uh, I don't know, too much melody in 4th of July, then may God have mercy on your soul. Now let's not conflate heavy for interesting, sweetheart. I mean, love what you love, but you drew first blood. Saying Soundgarden was only good until they cut their hair is like uh, saying the Beatles were only good until they grew theirs. Yeah, sure, their early stuff was fun and catchy. I'll be the first to admit it was great within this standard pop rock paradigm. But as their hair got longer, the lyrics and harmonic structure of their songs became more mature and started pushing some f***ing boundaries while maintaining the essence of what made their early work so damn good, ingenious, singable melodies. But, you know, hey, maybe you want to stop at Revolver and try to convince the world that Abbey Road sucks. Yeah, good luck with that. Then do we just pretend that exploration to the realm of melody and soul means nothing? Explain to me the punk f you of Ty Cobb from Down the Upside. Now hold my hand, love, as I show you the floaty bad trip of boot camp, where only a master musician could find a hook so deep in the mud. There's majestic mountains of sound right there. Boom, right there, bitch! But hey, it's all in good fun. Christmas Bloody Christmas is my type of holiday horror. It's trashy, gory fun, and I'm really hoping this becomes a midnight movie. You know, something to sneak a whiskey in and enjoy at the music box. And if you haven't seen it, I wholly recommend it. And my friends, if I don't see you again, I love you guys. Merry Christmas and have a happy new year. <laughs>